Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. We know that folks are continuing to see a lot of really difficult news around the country. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change the world for the better. And we believe that everyone of every identity, experience, and ability should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. We stand in support of human dignity, of respect, and of justice. And our Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers. Explorers are amazing scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, and so much more. And these Explorer Classrooms are short lessons with extended Q&As so that we can all get to know each other a little better. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom on school days at 2 p.m. Eastern time in addition to our usual events. So if you'd like, I could see you right back here tomorrow. But for today, we're very lucky to have Fred Hebert here to teach us about Egypt and about King Tut's treasures. Fred is an archeologist and explorer who has traced ancient trade routes over land and across seas for years and years and years now. We're gonna hear all about how his role as National Geographic's archeologist in residence has taken him all over the place. And today specifically, we're gonna be focusing on his work in Egypt and those amazing treasures from King Tut's tomb. Uh, but before we get to that lesson, I would like to acknowledge that we're joined up on screen by several student groups today. And we have so many more of you out there registered to watch along on YouTube. So happy to have you. You guys are representing so many cool places our students today are from Canada, India, Ireland, Romania, and the United Kingdom, plus Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, Vermont, Washington, and West Virginia. I have got just a couple special shout outs to give today. We've got Amelia K, Anaga and Vidya, Ava, Salen, Camden, Eden, Elise and Sophie, Emily, Emma B, Grace, um, Madam Kentles, grade two and grade three students, Margot, Matthias and Julian, Miss Grant's middle school scholars, good to see you guys, Miles Johnson, Olivia and Logan, Pavel, Ronalee, and the Ambridge, Joy, and Turner families. It's all great to have you out there. Um, that was a, an awful lot of you, but there's so, so many of you registered. I'm sure I missed most of you. So go ahead and say hello, introduce yourselves in the chat bar. We'd love to say hi and give you some shout outs. But for now, that is plenty for me. It's finally time to turn it over to Fred for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Hi, I'm, I'm Fred Hebert. Um, great, you see me? Great. We can and see you great. Thanks. Um, it's so great to see all of you and to have you join the uh, Explorers Classroom. I'm the archeologist in residence at National Geographic. And my goal in life is to inspire everybody to become explorers because really what we do here at National Geographic is open up the world for everybody. And that is so important. You know, global knowledge is, is really important to help us understand these difficult times here in the United States, but around the world as well. There's nothing like communications and talking to people, getting to know different cultures. And so I'm inspired to do this. I love working with our education group. I love talking to kids. And uh, I feel like this is my chance to come to your schools and, and actually talk to you, which I, I love to do. And I, I have been working around the world, as Celeste said. I worked in Afghanistan, Egypt, Peru, Greece, Mongolia, Mexico. I've even worked in a country, if you can identify it, you get two points, Kyrgyzstan. How about that, huh? It's really a very nice place. Um, but today I'm talking to you about one of my favorite places in the whole world and where I got started in archaeology, and that is in Egypt. And so I'm going to move to my um, program and we're just going to take a little trip to Egypt because that's that's where I would be right now if I wasn't here. Um, so let's get started. Oh. 
All right, we're going to be talking about ancient Egypt. I call it King Tut's treasures, but there's so much more to Egypt uh, than just that. And so really, we're going to beginning today. I mean, this is like I can't do everything uh, in one uh, explorer's classroom, but I'll give you an overview about why it's important to to be an archaeologist and what makes me really excited about Egypt. Um, and we'll see some King Tut there, too. But I got four things that we want to talk about today. Um, and we'll we'll start getting into it right away. But, you know, so why ancient Egypt? You know, what makes ancient Egypt a core civilization? That's a term. If you take world history, you'll learn about core civilizations. And, and how do how do we learn more about these core civilizations? Well, we archaeologists, we have three different ways that we work. One is we go out and make discoveries through through field work. And there's a lot more involved than just like being an Indiana Jones and finding something. I'll tell you about that. Second is being able to present what we find to the widest possible public because you know science is like that. Archaeology is a science. And if you don't tell the world about what you're doing, why do it? Right? And my favorite way to, to present archaeology is really to take people and transport them into my shoes um, and do it through museum exhibits. And I think it's so educationally important and such a, a learning, best way to learn is to actually see the objects itself. Finally, you know, we have a program called Saving the Past. And that's really about this term called cultural heritage, which is sort of the, the sense of identity that people get um, when they know that, that their civilization, they're part of world civilization, and it's global. We're part of a whole world community of, of people who have commuted back and forth literally for thousands of years. So, you know, what is a core civilization? Um, in this area from, Mesop from uh, Europe all the way to China, there are four main core civilizations. There's Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and China. They're all based around civilizations. They have four things in common, um, and each of them have them. They have monumental architecture and cities, like, well, how about the Great Pyramid of Egypt? They all have writing. In, in Egypt, we have hieroglyphs, but the oldest system are, are these. These are clay tablets called cuneiform tablets, but all four of the civilizations had that. All four core civilizations had kings, rulers. In Egypt, of course, you have pharaohs and queens. And all four core civilizations had surplus production. That means that they made more food than they needed for their population. They mined more gold. They mined more copper to make pots or or, um, or or bronze vessels, like this ritual vessel from ancient China, which is really, really heavy and it's ritually important. Well, we have the same thing you'll see in ancient Egypt. Um, so these are our four core civilizations. I'm focusing on Egypt, first of all, because I love it, but second of all, because it's very, very special in all those core civilizations. The people of ancient Egypt lived along this river, uh, the, this ribbon of green, fertile, uh, um, the valley of the Nile, right? That's, that's where everybody lived. That's where all the temples were built. That's where, where they did the commerce. Um, and because it was buffered on the north by the sea and on the west and the east and the south by deserts, it's the core civilization that lasted the longest. If you, if you look at the chronology here over here on this side of the screen, you know, we've got three different periods of Egyptian continuity of that, of cultural continuity of that core civilization from the old kingdom and the age of pyramids to the middle kingdom where everything was unified up and down the Nile River and the new kingdom, the time period of King Tot. And, and those, that, 3,000 years is epic and it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. It was so unbelievable that when I wanted to become an archeologist, 
I went to Egypt. It was really great. And what did I see when I went there? Just like everybody else, I went to Cairo to the National Museum to see the treasures of Tutankhamun. I mean, I think actually this mask of Tutankhamun, it's, it's a photo taken um, by my very good friend, the photographer, um, Ken Garrett, um, who's a National Geographic photographer. And he shows all these people, the thousands of visitors who come specifically to visit the treasures of King Tut. The, the museum only has about 200 of the artifacts on display, but there are over 5,500 of them in the, in the basement. Um, in the rest of the National Museum, there is so much stuff. There are all these coffins of the other kings and queens of Egypt. I mean, this one here is the coffin of a queen. It's 12 feet long. It's 12 feet long. What's that? Why is it so big? Well, I mean, she, was, she wasn't 12 feet tall, I can tell you that, but I mean, it, it's a mystery. And there is all, everything. There, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of mummies and uh, of these coffins and sarcophagi. There's another room that just has these wooden boat models. These were made during the Middle Kingdom. Um, these are models of the boats that would go up and down the, the Nile. And they also made models of daily life. And I mean, it's so beautiful. And, and there are so many of them. I mean, you see one here, but in, in the background, there's like, you know, another two dozen of them back there. Um, really <clears throat> quite, quite amazing. I mean, you kind of leave the National Museum, which is like, you know, two floors and it covers every period of Egypt. You think, well, there's, there's really nothing more to discover in ancient Egypt. I mean, they've got everything. And um, I mean, it, it takes several days to go through that museum. I tell you, it's really amazing. But you know what? <clears throat> There's a lot of mysteries. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. And, and to start learning more about that, the skill you really need to have is that of being a field archaeologist. So I went to Egypt to do my first field archaeology project longer ago than I want to say on camera. Um, but here's that first excavation. It was on the coast of Egypt. And here on the left-hand side, you see the surface of the ground. It's covered in pottery and bricks. So the head archeologist knew that this was the right place to dig, but it was just beneath the surface that the archeologists found these walls. They dug down and they found these walls. These are 2000 year old walls of a Roman aged building, 2000 years old. And they're just there, right? underneath the ground. And so we're digging with shovels and trowels and sieving the, the dirt. And uh, you know we're learning so much and we're finding so much. It's really amazing. Um, here's Carol drawing the edge of the excavation. And there's so much information that we have from the excavations that you don't find just by looking at the artifact. So let me explain. <clears throat> Here's one of those 2000 year old walls and it's going, going, and then the excavation stopped. But here you see the layers of decay of these buildings and you can actually see, maybe hopefully you can see this. Do you see the wall? It fell over, it fell down so that everything underneath is perfectly preserved. 2000 year old sandals, papyrus, pottery, coins, all this sort of stuff. There's another layer up here from uh, 800 years old from a merchant's building. I'll tell you about a little bit more about that and another building up here and then the surface debris covering everything. So we didn't really even know it was underneath there. And, and by reading this and, and Carol's drawing of this, we, we start learning a whole new story about Egypt. Um, well, these are my first excavations. This was, uh, 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 I, I was about 20 years old doing this. And uh, this is a merchant's house, medieval merchant's house. The merchant would come across uh, the Red Sea, come and deposit all of their goods here. And then it was, the goods would be picked up by camel and taken away. Um, it was only seasonally used warehouse, but it was chock-a-block full of stuff. Um, and this is the last day of excavations. And right here where my arrow is, um, I, I found a doormat in front of the door of the warehouse. And I found this key underneath the doormat. It's a wooden key under the doormat and it has the merchant's name on it, Haji Barakat. And I can't tell you my feeling, what it was like to be standing in front of an 800 year old warehouse 
and pull up the doormat and find a key. I never will ever, ever forget that story. Well, that's only part of doing discovery of archaeology. You also have to draw everything. Everything needs to be photographed. Everything needs to be analyzed. This is Jillian analyzing a 2,000-year-old fragment of cloth. Uh, she found out in her analysis that it actually came from India. Uh, we register everything before the artifacts get taken to the museum. And I want you to notice, it, this is part of our team here, that it's composed half of Egyptians and half of American citizens. Very important that all of our projects, and in fact, I'm very proud to say, all of our projects at National Geographic are collaborative with the scholars in, and the researchers in the country that we work. That's, that's always part of our project. Needless to say, I, I, was, I was very excited about this project and um, we were going, um, but I still wanted to go back and learn more about King Tut, right? It was great to learn about how archaeology is done and when it can tell us. So finally, when I became the archaeologist in residence at National Geographic, I had a chance to go see the tomb of King Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. And this is what we saw when we went down. This is the burial chamber. And it was amazing, all these painted walls, scenes painted. Um, but in the middle of the frame, there's a conservator. She's cleaning, meticulously cleaning the painting because it's almost 3,000 years old and a lot of tourists come there. So she's preserving this by cleaning it and taking care of it. It also gave us at National Geographic the, the chance, well, me particularly, to, to go right into the burial chamber and, um, and have a chance to, to look at this wall painting up close and personal. Because on our team, we had a scientist, a partner, a colleague of us, who came up with a hypothesis. Remember, we're scientists. He came up with a hypothesis that this gold wall, this is in the burial chamber of Tutankhamun, is a false wall, that behind it is hidden the tomb of Queen Nefertiti. And it's like, whoa, could it be? I mean, the, the gold paint is very special, but the conservators were finding layers and chips suggesting that it was gold painted on, on white. So it was a mystery, we didn't know. We brought a National Geographic team of engineers. Here, here's Alan and Eric, and they're using a very high tech radar device called ground penetrating radar uh, that allows us to see, quote unquote, see behind the wall um, to see if there is a, a, a chamber behind it, if it's a false wall. Well, you know, we worked with the permission of the Egyptians, with the Egyptians and the government, because we're, we're spending 24 hours together with King Tut. I mean, I had goosebumps the whole time. Uh, needless to say, our ground penetrating radar showed that that was a solid wall. So we didn't find the tomb of Queen Nefertiti. And she's, her tomb still remains a mystery. There are so many mysteries in, in Egypt. It's sort of like, well, maybe all the answers aren't in the National Museum. Maybe there's still more to do. So we became very interested in the whole notion of uh, Queen Nefertiti and other queens and, and actually even the role of women in Egypt because we couldn't tell from the hieroglyphs or the writing. So we put on an exhibition about the artifacts related to, to women of e ancient Egypt and queens of Egypt. And this is the second way that, that I wanna talk about how archeologists can get people inspired about the research that they do is by putting on these exhibitions. And again, it's so special. I just wanted to take you behind the scenes of an exhibition and show you what it's like to actually pick up and handle, you know, the only, one of the only known stone busts of Queen Nefertiti, of Queen Cleopatra. That's Queen Cleopatra, the last queen of Egypt. It's pretty amazing. Um, and to use artifacts to tell the story of the role of women in ancient Egyptian society. That's really never been done before. We're so excited about that. And uh, it took a lot of people to put it together, to put all the artifacts on display in the correct way. Um, we had dozens of people working on this. This is the museum team that worked so hard to put this together. It's all being done for this reason. 
because thousands, tens of thousands will come by to be able to look at these artifacts with their own eyes. It's so important. You, you learn so much by seeing an artifact. I mean, an artifact is worth a thousand words and it's just such a, a wonderful opportunity. It, you know, it makes me um, inspired to go back to Egypt and, and, and do more about this. But the last thing I wanna talk about before I hand it over to our question and answer period is, you know, uh, archeologists, helping to preserve cultural heritage because you know um, these artifacts are so rare you know if they get destroyed um, there's there's really nothing to do about that I mean they, you know it, it, it's gone right there's only one golden mask of Tutankhamun um, so when, when there's problems and uh, social unrest as there is today around the world in the United States but around the world, you know, even museums and historic sites, cultural heritage is at risk. This is a museum that got looted in Egypt. It's very sad for me to look at this picture, but it was even sadder for me to know that some of the artifacts from here were taken, they were stolen and they were taken and we found them in a warehouse outside of New York and in, in, in basically a, a garage. It was kind of amazing. And here's our, one of our team, Lauren, who's inspecting this giant coffin of, uh, of an Egyptian. I mean, clearly it's Egyptian. Here are two side panels from another one of these burial boxes called a sarcophagus, painted in hieroglyphics. You can see them all the way down here. These clearly were taken from Egypt. And what we want to do is inventory them, look at them. Look, even the, the painted boat models from the Nile Delta. These belong back in Egypt. These belong in a museum. And, you know, I'm happy to say that Egypt now is in the process of building a, a new museum to house all of these artifacts. This is the inside. That's a, that's a giant uh, statue of King Ramses II, who was one of the uh, biggest, most powerful kings of, of Egypt following Tutankhamun. Um, but there is a special room upstairs where they will put all 5,500 of Tutankhamun's artifacts on display. This museum will be ready in two years, which happens to be the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb of King Tut. Now, before we go on, I just want to go over the things that we spoke about today. First of all, there's still tons to discover in Egypt. And, you know, we do it through excavation and field work, but we also have to record it and analyze it. It's a lot of work to do. We love to share our research with the, as many people as possible through education, like this webinar or through exhibition for public education and to share the excitement. Finally, archeologists are involved in preserving cultural heritage that shouldn't be looted or stolen. With that, um, Back to you, Celeste. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Fred. This has been spectacular. For folks learning along with us at home, we would love to see what you do with this. Maybe you do a follow-up activity from our family guide. You draw a picture or write a story. Maybe you even make your own King Tut mask. Whatever it is, please send it to us by tagging at Nat Geo Education and using hashtag Explorer Classroom on Twitter. That way we can make sure Fred gets a chance to see all of your awesome work. But now it's time for questions like Fred said. So if you are watching online, you can send us your questions in the YouTube chat sidebar. A lot of you are already doing that. It's looking great. We record everything that comes in. So please only send your message one time. If you spam us, we'll have to put you in timeout, which is no fun. Um, and if you're up here on screen with me, get your nice loud voice ready. I will let you know when it's your turn. Our first question today comes to us from Adele who is wondering, Fred, you've been to so many different places. Is there a place that you haven't gotten to go that you want to? Oh, wow, that's, that's, really, that, that's a great question. I, um, I really try to, to um, look at those areas of great civilizations, those core civilizations, and think about all those cool places in between. Um, that re really haven't been focused on, right? You know, so I, I think about, you know, the area between be, between Egypt and Mesopotamia, and um, I, I just spent 
um, my last field work was actually working in Jerusalem on some churches that were endangered. And that, that was really satisfying to, to work with, with a big team, a team from Greece. Um, so I have had a chance to work there. I mean, I, I really think that, that um, uh, one of the places that I haven't really worked in that I would love to work in more is actually here in the United States, right? I spent most of my career working on the Silk Road or in Egypt, or I've also dug in Peru and Mexico, but you know, I'm just, I, I love, I also work on US history for, for educational materials. You may see our textbook um, on US history, but I know that there are so many untold stories here in the United States, just as many as there are in ancient Egypt. And so, Strangely enough, even though it's the territory right underneath my feet, I would love to do some field work in the US. Love that. Well, we've got kind of a celebrity in the audience. Cynthia Bell commented that she actually played King Tut in a school wax museum project. So <laughs> can't, wait, can't wait to hear more, Cynthia. <laughs> And we've got Aiden, who is wondering what the most expensive treasure King Tut had was. The most expensive treasure that King Tut had was that giant solid gold burial mask. Now, he obviously didn't have that in his daily life, but that is such a massive piece. It's, it's, it's the, the largest piece of solid gold, perhaps in, in all of ancient Egypt. And you know what was interesting is that is that Tutankhamun, you know, he he died when he was 19 years old. He it was an accident. He didn't mean to, to do that. And uh, but because his tomb is the only one um, that that was not looted, it, its its front door was covered up. Um, it gives us an idea of the kind of treasures that might have been in other pharaohs' tombs or other queens' tombs if one would be found that was unlooted, I mean, there, I think you would find even more magnificent things because Egypt really did produce things in surplus. And uh, you, you can definitely see that in all those burial goods. Love that. All right, well, let's go to Sonia for our next questions. Sonia, go ahead and uh, turn your microphone on and ask away. Um, so, um, I read that King Tut was buried in someone else's tomb. Is that true? Well, that's a great question, Jonia. That's exactly what we were um, looking for when, when we looked at the, uh, we, we used our radar to search for false walls in King Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, we were looking for the, the idea that maybe there is a larger tomb um, and it was shortened because, because when he died so early, uh, they weren't ready. They didn't have a tomb ready uh, for him. So, it, you know, we, we found that he wasn't buried in Nefertiti's tomb, which is what we had thought. The whole world was expecting for us to find that. And I, I tell you, I was really exciting, but you know, we do science and science told us the answer to that story. So um, it wasn't a bigger tomb. We clearly, you know, for, for, for the Pharaoh to die in an accident when he was 19, they, they had to use a tomb that was already prepared. So it was prepared maybe for a nobleman or maybe for somebody else. Um, we, we, we now know that it wasn't a bigger tomb, you, you know, uh, that, that was previously somebody else's tomb and it was just a part of it but we don't know whose tomb it was he, he actually uh, used, um, the, the small one. Gotta love mysteries. All right, yeah. well, we've got kid conservationist online who is wondering if archeologists get to find anything that they keep, or I'm sorry, get to keep anything that they find. Ooh, sorry, kid conservationist. I read it very poorly. Yeah. That, that, that's a great question because you know you get you get the impression maybe from Indiana Jones that that you know the archaeologist is going to to keep what they find. I mean, uh, what we keep is that memory and that treasure of knowing where it came from. That's that's priceless, right? You know, seeing that Roman wall as it fell down 
on on that site on the coast. Uh, that that's a piece of knowledge that that doesn't exist as an artifact, right? Now, needless to say, I'm going to show you something, and don't be shocked. This is a replica. This is made out of plaster, but but this is one of those cuneiform tablets with the writing on it. This is actually a tablet that documents a flood myth. But this is made out of plaster. So cool. Well, let's go to Stephen and Kira for our next question. Do you want to find Queen Nefertini's tomb? Unless, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Fred, do you want to find Queen Nefertiti's tomb? Is that still something you're trying to do? Oh, so much, so much. You know, uh, I think, I think, um, what 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 I've really found in in doing the research on, on ancient Egypt, both in field work and in museums, is that um, even though there are dozens of books written about uh, about the the kings and queens of e Egypt, there there's so little that we actually know that if we find one intact tomb or one intact um, you know every, everything we find could completely rewrite the history books. And you know, I like to say the ultimate job of an archeologist is basically, we wanna put your textbooks out of date, right? <laughs> you know, um, we want you to say, it's no, no, it's not like that. It's completely different. Amazing. Well, Fred, we've got a lot of people who are wondering um, about sort of more of an overview of King Tut's life. What do we know? Well, we certainly know that he was born uh, to, to a, um, a, a, a pharaoh, Ankenhaten, who had sort of rebelled against uh, the traditions of core Egyptian civilization, who had a whole pantheon of gods and goddesses. And uh, he reduced Egyptian religion to just worshiping the sun god, just one. And it was radical. Uh, it was so radical that he even moved um, his capital uh, away from, from Luxor uh, to a, a place called Amarna. And um, uh, people weren't very happy with that. And uh, Akan Hatton's uh, wife, he had several wives, but one of them was, was Nefertiti. Um, we, we, so we know that Akan Hatton is King Tutankhamun's father. We're not quite sure who his mother was, um, but we know that that with Ankenhaten's death, the whole situation moved back, and and King Tut, even though he was associated with his dad, changed everything back to the old time core civilization religion. So that's what he's famous for. We also know that he loved hunting, and he he was probably a good warrior because there are a lot of depictions of him on chariots. He have he has a, a lot of chariots in his burial. We also know for a fact um, that he had a lame foot. He had a foot that may have been injured in battle or hunting or a, a chariot. Um, he had 130 walking canes in his tomb, 130. Yeah, people don't know that. Um, and he was buried with all 130 of them. Um, so we know that he, he actually wasn't that healthy. We know that he loved hunting. We, we know that he engaged in war, warfare. We also know that he was married and that, that um, they, they were unsuccessful in having children, even though he was just 19. Um, and, and aside from that, there, the rest of his life is, is, you know, there's a lot of conjecture, but, um, but you know, he died so young, he didn't have an official his, historical record about that, right? Well, maybe we can get you some more field assistance from our audience today to, to go out and learn a little bit more about him. Get ready and, to go to Egypt. Yeah, I think I think almost anyone would take you up on that offer, yeah. Fred. We've got Alicia out there who's wondering if you've ever found anything in ancient Egypt uh, that wasn't a mummy that was buried inside of a tomb. Sure, we find we find that that tombs have uh, tons of stuff um, be, because 
the the tomb is actually created in ancient Egypt. The tomb is created to keep people um, keep the mummy for eternity. So in general, the the uh, tombs are filled either with actual you know bread and jars of of honey and wine. Um, you know their chairs, their chariots, their their clothes. They're they're buried with with, with all all of that stuff, and um, you know, and sometimes if you couldn't bury it, have have everything buried with you, you just got an artist to paint all those things on the side of the wall. So it, it may be it may be just tomb painting or carving, um, but but you know, basically, if we find an intact tomb, then that will be a a, a time capsule for the entire life. Of that person, right? And usually, from from early time, like like Todd had had his his uh, um, baby chair in it, right? There was a little chair; it was about two feet tall. So neat. Yeah, it was really Your cool. Next question from Hadley, who's up on screen with us. Oh, Hadley, you're still muted. I'm sorry. Perfect. If peasants ate bread and drank alcohol. What would King Tut have eaten? Well, it, peasants did um, eat bread and uh, uh, drink wine and beer. By the way, they, they, there was a lot of brewing because because they they had wheat. They had tremendous amount uh, of wheat. And um, uh, we actually, I, I was recently in Egypt visiting the bakery where where the the pharaohs who who um, built the py pyramids were. Um, the pharaohs probably had similar diet to what everyone. Does I mean Egyptians are Egyptians? They love bread, they love wine, they love beer. Um, uh, they were great hunters, so one could imagine that that the the royalty probably had a little bit more meat on the table than everyday person. Um, but I I think in general, um, th their diet wouldn't have been that different. So cool. We've got some questions about the things that you've discovered, Fred. So we've got Ben who's wondering what the strangest or weirdest thing you've ever found is, and Louisa who's wondering what the oldest thing you've found is. Well, those are both great questions. Um, I, I'll tell you about the thing, the oldest uh, thing that I found um, first, because then I have to think about the strangest thing I've found. <laughs> But um, the oldest thing I, I found was from excavations in a country which I didn't even tell you about, Turkmenistan. There's another one for your map quiz. Um, Turkmenistan, it's just north of Iran. It used to be part of the Soviet Union, um, but it, 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 I, I excavated a site um, that, that was the oldest site that I had personally worked on. It was a site that was associated with the origins of agriculture. Um, because in this area, north of Iran, is the place where bread wheat was domesticated. It's, it's a form of wheat um, which was grown specifically so that um, it would rise. Like Egyptian bread or Mesopotamian bread probably was hard as a rock. It was flat or they made gruel and um, you know, it just, it wasn't soft and fluffy. In this area of, of uh, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, they actually developed bread wheat that would have been nice and fluffy. Um, and, and you can see it in the grain. And so we were, we were digging as deep as I ever have, 7,000, 8,000 years old. Um, and in our oldest, in our lowest level, we found the earliest bread wheat in, in the world. And actually it was so astonishing, it was this little, tiny carbonized little black grain. It was about, about that big, right? Um, and it was so exciting that the president of Turkmenistan built us a museum for that grain and put it right in the center. So cool. That Instead of the best thing since sliced bread, it can be the best thing since fluffy bread. But I, you know, um, back, back, back to the weirdest thing I ever think. I, I think really, um, it goes back to Egypt again. Um, Egypt has this incredible preservation of of materials, everything from uh, papyrus to, as you saw, wood. I, I found in one of the excavations, um, again, back on the Red Sea coast where everything is preserved. Um, I found a large 
uh, round piece of wood that had two ends on it. And it took about a year of snooping around and looking to find that it was actually part of a bird trap. And it was like, oh man, it was like, it took me 10 minutes to find it and a year to figure out what it was. Amazing. Well, good determination so that you could give us that answer today. Yeah. Let's grab our next question from Johnny, who's up on screen with us. Was it true that King Tut broke his leg? Was it true that King Tut broke his leg? Yes, it is. It's, it, it is true. Um, there is a, um, a, a thing that's like a giant x-ray machine. It's called a CT scanner. It does a whole series of x-rays like this. So you can see the bones inside a mummy in 3D. Can you believe that? That's what, that's the technology that, that you can find in a modern hospital today. But we were putting mummies in the CT scanner and we got this 3D picture. And sure enough, King Tut's leg was broken. Cool. Yeah. We've got Mia online who's, who's wondering about uh, sort of ethics in archaeology. What are, you, what are your opinions as an archaeologist on disturbing human remains to take them from their tombs and, and put them on display in museums? That's a really good question. And it, it's both about excavation and um, m museum work. You know, we, we have a very strong uh, ethical set of rules in, in, um, in both archaeology and, and, and in museums that, that we don't do anything without having a really good purpose, right? Um, and the reason in terms of excavation is because when, when you excavate, when you take your shovel and you, you dig something up, you're actually destroying its context, right? It won't ever come back. You will never be able to tell that story of digging stuff up. So you have to have a very good reason to want to start excavating. And that includes burials. And, you know, I, I um, have worked in many countries. When I, when I worked in Peru, where they have a lot of mummies, the, the, the ethical thing to do is work with the local community and ask them their permission. If they give you their permission and you have a good reason to do it, then, then you know, uh, there's probably something very special you can learn from. Um, in, in Egypt, we have the situation where there are so many mummies that they're already in all the museums. There's a, and, and Peru is sort of the same way. They have enough, they have enough mummies. Like you, you have to have really good reasons. Like there's so many mummies that, that I went into somebody's house and, and they had them in, lined up in their house. I mean, it was like wild. Um, but, but there has to be a good reason for putting any sort of mummified remain on exhibition. It's just not ethically correct to have, you know, some part of a human remain on display for, for the purpose of, uh, because it's interesting or something like, it really has to have some very good purpose. And then we make the decision on a case by case basis if it is honorable and respectable enough, but it's a case by case, but it has to, has to be done for a very specific and good educational reason. So great. Thank you for that, Fred. And let's head to the Phipps family for our next question. Go for it, Ava. So when I was reading, I saw that some tombs had extended like tunnels to where they'd like bury other stuff or had treasure and um somebody thought that tut had that but it appeared not but is there any other tomb that you've dug up that has those extended tunnels yeah that's a great question well you know i also am very selective about about um you know which like what burials to excavate. So I, I actually end up excavating more settlements and like port sites and trade sites. But um, uh, certainly there have been many cases in Egypt uh, where there are uh, long tunnels and, and there are false walls, right? You know, this idea that, that they covered up the wall because they didn't want people to go in. Absolutely, we know that's absolutely true. And there are even 
certain tombs in the Valley of the Kings, sort of the royal tombs, where the only way we know that it's a tomb is that, you know, tomb raiders years and years and years ago broke through one of the false walls. And you can see the wall mural comes to an end here, and then there's a doorway, and then it continues on the other side. They broke through that wall mural because they were trying desperately to keep people away from these tombs. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. No. Amazing. They did a lot of those. Well, Fred, do you have any advice for the young explorers out there watching today? Yes, I do. I think, you know, the, the, thing, the excitement about archaeology um, is getting to learn about the world, right? And I think that's really important. I know that you are all probably taking some sort of world history course or great civilizations course. You know, when you get to middle school, you can do a great civilizations course. But, you know, what, what I really hope is that you are inspired um, to learn about the world and everything that's in it, to learn about the modern people, to learn about the ancient cultures, to come and respect the people who share deep history. Think about this. Think about the fact that, that China has a 5,000 year history, um, that India has a 5,000 year history, that, that, you know, that Iraq, Iran, Syria, these, these some of them war-torn areas were the cradle of Western civilization, sort of wh where Greece and Rome came from. So I think the most important thing, and I urge everybody to, to follow their dreams. And, uh, you know, if you can study archaeology, please do it, because it's a way to learn about the world in a way that you actually get to pick things up with your hands and see science um, you know, in the process of happening. I can't think of something that's a, a, a greater learning experience. It makes you curious, makes you wonder about the world. Uh, it, it, it gives you an excitement about being a world citizen that I just think everybody should have. Amazing. Well, for everyone out there, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Be sure to share your work with us on Twitter. We hope to see you at our upcoming events. We'll be back at it again tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. You could even bookmark the page you're watching on right now so that it's even easier for you to show up. Uh, and before we sign off, I want to invite everyone up on screen with me to turn your mics on. Let's get nice and loud and tell Fred goodbye and thank you. Ready? Bye. Thank you. Thank you.